Great, and um, thank you very much for the invitation to, to join this important discussion um, in the lead up to COP26. Um, we all know that across and within borders, people are on the move. And of course, there are lots of reasons for that. Some people choose to move for, for work or for love, whether that be for a person or, or for a country. Um, and some people just do it because they can. Um, but it's really important to remember that for a significant number of those on the move, it can't be described as a choice. And I would invite you for this discussion um, to think about rather than calling these people migrants, considering that these are people who are forcibly displaced. And in order to set the scene, have a think about the different circumstances which can lead to forcible displacement. And you'll see here on the, on the screen that the principal causes and some very obviously spring to mind conflict. Um, there I'm talking about armed conflict or, or political conflict of the kind that results in, for example, the dispossession of Palestinian people, which we'll hear more about from John. And then natural disasters, earthquakes, tsunamis and the like, which lead people to abandon their homes and ethnic cleansing. And we can all remember, for example, the, the Rwandan genocide in 1994 and how that caused people to flee to, to Burundi and, and to the Congo in the wake of that. And then, of course, there are man-made disasters like Chernobyl, which meant people had to evacuate quickly. And let's not forget about human trafficking, where people are coerced into moving from one place to another, because slavery, sadly, isn't something that we can consign to the 19th century. It's still very much alive and well and happening today. And in fact, I understand something like 40 million people are estimated to be victims of modern slavery today. Many of those will be trafficked. And then there are other things like crop failure, criminal activity, and I'm thinking here of violence suffered by communities at the hands of drugs cartels, gangs, and so on, which cause people to flee. And then of course, the, the subject of today, climate change, desertification, sea rise, sea level rise, deforestation, land degradation, all these things that mean people have to abandon their homeland. And it's interesting because I think the first thing that I think of with forcible displacement is conflict, but actually the figures suggest that a higher number of people are internally displaced as a result of climate related disasters than conflict. And climate change can be considered what we call a threat multiplier because it leads to food and water insecurity and competition over resources. And that in itself can cause conflict and that in itself can cause people to be displaced. It undermines regional stability. And I mention that because it might help us to understand why some people frame climate change in terms of national security and not just as an environmental issue. To give us an idea of the numbers involved in uh, forcible displacement, I'm showing you some statistics pulled together by UNHCR, the, the refugee agency of the United Nations for last year. And you can see that the numbers are not small. We're talking about 80 million people who could be described as forcibly displaced. Often people assume that, that those folk move to another country, but in actual fact, more than half try to forge a new life in another part of their own country. These are the people that we call internally displaced persons or IDPs. And some of us refer to people who are forcibly displaced as refugees, but I'd like to stress that from a legal perspective, the terms are not interchangeable. Strictly speaking, only around a quarter of people who are forcibly displaced can properly be described as refugees and an even smaller number as asylum seekers, that is people who are seeking refugee status or something akin to it. And I'll show you why that is. This is the definition of a refugee as set out in the 1951 Refugee or Geneva Convention. 
just take a moment to read it, you'll see that the definition is of a person who's unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted. And aside from the difficulty of proving that such a fear is well-founded, just think about all of those people who are displaced as a result of natural disasters, man-made disasters, crop failure, climate change, or quite simply poverty. They just don't fit the definition. And you might think, well, that doesn't really matter. It's just a label, but it's not the case because the, the people that fall within this narrow category of refugees are the ones who are entitled to what we call international protection. And that's a, a regime of rights, such as permission to settle in another country, access to healthcare, schools, benefits, eligibility for formal resettlement schemes like the UK's scheme to resettle Syrian refugees. For the people who are not classed as refugees, that regime of international protection is largely beyond their reach. So to quote Antonio Guterres, who is the UN Secretary General, as the forcibly displaced are not covered by the protection regime, they find themselves in a legal void. The majority of forcibly displaced people have little or no prospect of being permitted to resettle elsewhere, of accessing rights and benefits or of forging a better life. So I'm suggesting to you that it's little wonder that many of these people try their luck with the asylum system or indeed opt to live as undocumented migrants. Wouldn't you? Back in 2013, it seemed that more and more people were making desperate attempts to reach Europe in order to have a crack at claiming asylum. And I suspect we can all remember how our TV screens were filled with images of people crammed into overcrowded dinghies and reports of those who were drowning en route for the Federation of Protestant Churches in Italy, which we call FJ, the night of 3rd October 2013 was a tipping point. That was a night when, tragically, 368 people, mainly Eritrean, died. They drowned off the coast of Lampedusa, a tiny Italian island just 100 or so miles from the coast of Tunisia. And it was in the wake of that tragedy that FJ resolved to divert energy and resources to this project, to which I'm seconded, called Mediterranean Hope. In the eight years since the project began, it has developed into something quite remarkable and wide-ranging, and I won't have time today to talk about all the different things that Mediterranean Hope does, but I will briefly highlight three areas of work. It all began on Lampedusa, that tiny island, just that two people sent to work with uh, the beleaguered local community to welcome people, those who against the odds were arriving in those unfit vessels from North Africa. And today the team still welcomes, still gathers data and crucially still records the stories of the people who arrive. And this image drawn by my colleague Francesco Piovici when he was working on Lampedusa doesn't just depict the island and the graveyard and boats at the bottom of the sea. The colour that drains out of the picture onto the ocean floor represents the loss of identity suffered by those who cross, as they become for many just statistics. And part of the work that Mediterranean Hope does is to recover people's identities through the collection and sharing of the stories of the people who make it and those who don't. What happens to people when they land? Well, they're all taken to the detention centre. That's the hotspot. They're all fingerprinted and, and now they all spend at least two weeks on a quarantine ship moored off the island. Some are then immediately sent back. And many are dispersed to reception centres throughout Italy where they make a formal claim for asylum. And depending on where they end up, 
depending on which reception centre they're in, there are varying levels of support. But know this, 80% of asylum claims in Italy are rejected at first instance. This young man, and we'll call him George, is one of those people. He fled the Gambia in his early 20s, fearing for his life after posting comments on social media about the leader of a faith different to his own. And the death threats that he received left him in no doubt about the danger that he was in. But his troubles were only just beginning because he then had to cross several countries and about two and a half thousand miles to Libya, where he hoped to take a boat to Europe and to safety. He was captured, he was detained and he was abused whilst he was in detention, along with his fellow detainees. His meals were drugged to reduce his defences and he was made to drink salt water. He was able to leave detention only because one of the guards in the detention centre decided he would have George for himself. And over the next six weeks, he was then systematically exploited by this man and his wife. He found the strength to flee, flee to the coast and take one of those boats. And after 11 terrifying hours at sea, he and his passengers were rescued by a German NGO and disembarked on Lampedusa. Despite the horrors, he describes himself as one of the lucky ones. I first met him in Piedmont in the north of Italy, where he was sent from Lampedusa. And there he was put in touch with the diaconal arm of the Waldensian Church, one of FJ's member denominations. And its reception programme provided him with accommodation, with language training and support to make his claim for asylum. And he has worked like a Trojan to integrate into Italian society, first by adding Italian to the other six languages that he already speaks, and then by volunteering in a care home whilst undertaking study and training for work. And he's now a fully qualified boss, an auxiliary nurse, working full time in a home for people with psychiatric difficulties. But although he has a job, he has a part of his own, he has good friends here, his asylum claim, five years on, still hasn't been determined. Like 91% of the people from the Gambia who seek asylum in Italy, his claim was rejected at first instance, and the appeal has been set for the end of September. Despite everything, he is hopeful and actually pretty bullish. I spoke to him last week and he said to me, if Italy doesn't want me at this point, I'm ready to move on. What else can I do? This lottery faced by asylum seekers and the horror of people dying at sea convinced those who coordinate Mediterranean hope that whilst responding to emergency situations is important, it is better still to find ways to avert them. The lucrative business of people smuggling survives in part because there aren't other options available for people. So Mediterranean Hope asked itself if we couldn't find a way to address this, if we couldn't find a way to open a pathway which would enable people to come legally and safely to Italy and once here be properly supported to settle and integrate into Italian society. And that is how humanitarian corridors were born, a concept and a project developed by FJ along with the Sant'Egidio community from the Catholic Church. The third partner is the Waldensian Church, uh, which provides significant funding through the Otto Perilli tax scheme. And the fourth partner, importantly, is the Italian government, which grants the visas for the scheme a thousand visas every two years. And this mechanism brings people safely and legally to Italy from refugee camps in Lebanon. Most of them Syrian, some of them Palestinian, some of them from other places. All of them have been assessed as being in need of international protection prior to departure. They're all vulnerable asylum seekers and almost all of them will ultimately acquire refugee status. They include unaccompanied minors, single people, and indeed entire families, sometimes two or three generations at a time. 
and they come on Alitalia flights with their own luggage, with humanitarian visas, with clearance to travel. And before leaving, they're carefully prepared by our team in Beirut and by trained professionals, both practically and psychologically, for what lies ahead. On arrival, they're supported by FJ or by the Santa Gidio community for around 18 months or longer if needed, long enough to be on their way to settling into Italian society. And if time permits later, I can tell you stories about some of them. The point is their experience is radically different from that of the people who take a chance with boats crossing the Mediterranean. And for me, it's clear that safe and legal pathways are the way forward. Just calling asylum seekers illegal or externalizing borders by sending asylum seekers to other territories to be processed, as I hear is currently on the agenda, doesn't address the bold fact that displacement is not about to stop anytime soon. How are we as a global community going to enable people who are displaced for whatever reason to find a home and improve their lot? Award-winning schemes like this programme are rightly applauded, but regrettably, a thousand visas from the Italian government every two years is not going to solve the situation of the thousands who are in need. And even if FJ is successful in realising its ambition to expand the programme out of Africa and into Europe, it won't resolve the situation of those who, who frankly don't have a hope of ever succeeding in an asylum claim and are displaced for reasons not covered by the 1951 Convention. The situation, this is the situation of the hundreds of casual laborers who in Italian context can be found in Calabria, harvesting tomatoes, citrus fruits and olives for a pittance, often managed by gang masters, often living in horrendous conditions without access to electricity or to running water. And it can be tempting to describe these people as economic migrants but I'd like you to consider the possibility that the majority have been forcibly displaced. And I'll just take a moment to say something about the work that Mediterranean Hope is doing in that sphere to this group who for very obvious reasons are often undocumented. Again, it began with a team of just two people in a van providing information to those who needed it. But again, now the work it does in that region is many layered. And along with other NGOs such as Doctors for Human Rights, Mediterranean Hope is working to improve the lot of casual labourers, both in terms of their living conditions, but also in terms of their rights. And a bigger piece of work is being done to tackle exploitation directly. Our team is working in cooperation with a local cooperative, SOS Rosarno, to construct an ethical supply chain and market for high quality products that are being harvested. Local producers are being encouraged to sign up and once they do, they abide by a code of ethics in relation to employee pay and working conditions. They benefit from being able to market their products to buyers at home and abroad who want to sustain a fair trade initiative. The workers benefit directly from improved pay and conditions. Mediterranean Hope benefits from a tiny cut of the profit which we plough back into social projects for those workers. Everyone wins. The ethical oranges are being snapped up, not just by uh, Italian churches, but also by German churches and other buyers across the globe. And as well as benefiting everyone directly involved, it is helping us to raise awareness of this issue of exploitation, an issue which is not confined to Italy, but exists across the world. As I said before, Med Mediterranean Hope is a remarkable and wide ranging project seeking to address the challenges of migration from numerous angles. And I know that you might feel as an individual that there isn't much that you can do to shift the balance. But I'd like to suggest that this year's COP26 does present us all with an unusual opportunity because the world's attention is going to be focused on the effects of climate change not just on the planet itself, but also on how it affects individuals and communities. 
And so I guess I'm urging you all to start a national conversation about the people that we might refer to as climate refugees, about the lack of international protection for those people, and indeed for the others who don't fit that narrow definition of refugee. Think about lobbying the UK government to consider supporting these people, and while they're at it, everyone else who's forcibly displaced. 